So I think it's really important if they say, hey, we want this to be profitable, then they should work to build a consumer experience, a shopping experience that has the right level of assortment, the right kind of items, the right pricing, the right merchandising, the right integration with their brand, and a thoughtful strategy around what they expect to happen when customers show up on their site and see both new and used product. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. It seems like you can't go anywhere without reading or seeing or hearing the word resale. And of course, Retail Touch Points is no exception. We've been covering the trend quite a bit lately, and that is largely thanks to some incredible new partnership news and announcements from companies like ThreadUp. Today on the show, we have the company's president, Anthony Marino, on, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into the trend. So we're not just going to talk about why it's important or what's happening at a high level. I feel like we've done that quite a bit. We're going to get into the growth opportunity, what's driving that growth opportunity, and most importantly, how innovation and differentiation play a role here, right? Because product is important, but so is experience. So whether you already have a resale strategy and you're looking for ways to improve upon it, Or maybe you're new to this entire thing and you don't know where to start or how to develop the best strategy. I think this conversation is a great way to set yourself up for success. Anthony, it's so great to finally have you on the show. Thanks so much for taking the time. Hi, Alicia. It's great to be here. I am so excited to do a bit of a check-in, I guess you could say, about this world of resale because I know we have been covering it a lot on the retail touchpoint side. So let's start with the high-level stuff here, the numbers. ThreadUp's annual resale report predicted that the U.S. resale market will grow to 70 billion, with a B for the folks listening, by 2027, nine times the growth of the broader retail sector. To start, who or what is driving this growth potential? Because that is insane. Yeah, it's a big number, 70 billion. And I've been doing this for about a decade, working in resale and in digital resale in particular. And I have to say that I'm really more bullish about the prospects than ever. I guess, first off, younger people are really making second nature to them. So if you are a young shopper, The data shows that you're actually thinking about buying secondhand first. And if you can't buy it secondhand, then you'll resort to buying it new. But it's a primary purchase consideration for shoppers, especially the youngest. The second is, is issues around sustainability are more front and center than ever. And that's across all age groups. And we've all learned a lot more about the global climate crisis. We see governments getting involved. We see stats like buying and wearing secondhand clothing instead of new reduces carbon emissions by 25%. So it's actually something you can do that makes a difference. And then finally, technology has brought millions of thrifters into the resale market just because it's easy, but doesn't require you to sort through racks. It doesn't require this hit or miss experience where does the store have what's in your size or in the brand you're looking for. There's incredible assortment variety and consistency in the experience. And so all of those things are making the market really grow at a healthy clip. And we're really excited about that. Yeah, a good distillation of some of those key trends or factors driving this growth. And one thing we talked about previously in one of our past conversations that always sticks with me, Anthony, is that the perception around shopping resale is is kind of shifting, right? It's like this idea that it's a bit more cloud driven or this idea of like, oh, yes, I found this great item and oh, it's at a reasonable price. And there's also that sustainability component. So it all kind of ties together. But I do want to dig into your point around digital kind of being an enabler or even an accelerator for resale because you're right, access creates ease. It helps democratize things a little bit. But I I do want to give the proper spotlight to some of the work that you're doing with one partner, American Eagle, that kind of reimagines the physical side of it, or, you know, some people may even say it makes it a bit more fidgetal. I know some people feel strongly about that word, but I think I think it's the best one to explain this. Can you share a little bit more about 
re-AE the goals, the strategy, and even the opportunity behind it? Because I think it's fascinating. Yeah, sure. Let me take a step back. So in addition to running and operating our own resale site at ThreadUp.com and in our app, we also power resale experiences for brands. So there are about 50 brands who ThreadUp powers resale experiences for on a white label basis. So they just are able to have a used clothing section or a circularity program on their website that we power and we do all the work for them and they really profit from day one. Um, American Eagle is a brand that is a new addition to our roster of companies who we're powering resale for on a white label basis. And we're excited about that because AE is really a brand that's defined youth culture for decades. And so it was really important for them to find new ways to connect with their shoppers and show that they are on the pulse of sustainability and individualism and what their buyers want. So And they have a very young and digitally savvy customer who's highly motivated to shop secondhand. So what they're doing is, as part of the promotion for the program, is they've launched a Snapchat feature in addition to an online resale shop, which allows users to view the secondhand collection through an exclusive AR shopping lens. So it's sort of set up like a vintage store. And American Eagle pieces are displayed throughout the space for users to explore. They can click on products, select them, learn more about their product, understand their impact on sustainability, and and just sort of have this experience that kind of tries to be more seamless and linking customers directly to resale. So it's a pretty innovative approach for them. It's one that we love to see because it's not a one size fits all. They really know who their shopper is. They know what their care abouts are. And they've really been smart about creating a resale experience that reflects their brand DNA. You know, it's it's true to them. And we think that increasingly retail brands, apparel brands are going to tailor resale experiences for their customers. And it's one of the things ThreadUp's really excited about working with brands on their behalf to power that for them. Yeah, it's great. And I agree. American Eagle, I feel like has always been very connected and in tune with their customer, but especially over the past few years, they've really, I think, balanced staying true to the heritage and to the customer, but also testing some really really incredible, innovative digital experiences and new platforms. And they're tinkering, but in a way, I think to your point, that is thoughtful and strategic. So with a project like this in mind, obviously not every brand is going to want to do an experience like this, nor would it make sense. But is it fair to say that there's room for further innovation in terms of how consumers interact with and even experience resale for these different brands? Here's the thing. The numbers around consumer shopping secondhand are massive. And so every brand, particularly in apparel, should be thinking about how they want to approach it. And look, they may decide, hey, this isn't for us, but I think it would be a mistake for them to not have a a deliberate point of view. And so I think you said the key word, which is testing. I think brands who are willing to test different ideas behind different goals in either a resale shop or a circularity experience or integrating it with other platforms the way we did with ReAE, I think those are all really a smart attitude to take towards resale because the the wave is building. Consumers are buying secondhand clothing, whether they're buying it from you or buying it from someone else. And so I think if you're a brand and you're trying to figure out a way to, to acquire customers or to position yourself as a more credible contributor to the solutions behind fashion waste and and warming, but getting involved in resale is a really powerful way to do it. So with that, obviously, ThreadUp works with various brands. I mean, Fabletics, J. Crew, so many more, and across so many different categories, even pricing structures, right? Like I think for a while there was this assumption that it was very much luxury driven, but now we're seeing it across the gamut, right? So I guess with that question, are there any universal challenges or pain points that emerge in your discussions with partners or possible partners in bringing resale to market, right? Because I think there are a few different layers, and I know we've we've spoken about them. There's like the experience for the consumer, but then there's also like the back end, you know, making it all work and operate. I'm sure that's that's where you guys help, but also just making it a profitable and meaningful component of the business. So I know that's like a widespread of issues, but are there any universal challenges or, or pain points that are emerging right now? Yeah, you know, I almost think of them as there's perceived challenges and then there's actual challenges. Okay. And I think 
I probably think the biggest perceived challenge sometimes retailers or brands get kind of wrapped around as they're trying to think about how they participate in resale is the operational side of it. Just how are we going to do this? How are we going to offer this incredibly attractive selection of great clothing that's photographed well, that's attributed, that's priced properly? And I call it a perceived challenge because that is all the hard work that those brands can offload to us at ThreadUp. I mean, this is what we do. We have millions and millions of units of processing capacity in our DCs. We have 10 years and reams of data around pricing for brands. We've developed a platform that manages photography and put away these goods in an automated way. So they can really think of ThreadUp as they're kind of like fulfilled by partner for resale and we can power it for them. So that perceived challenge, I encourage brands and retailers to sort of put it aside because we can do that for them and they don't have to pay up front for that. They don't have to reach into their pockets. They just plug into our platform. And then the minute items start to sell that they feature on their website, they make money. And so I think that's the biggest perceived challenge. I think some of the other challenges that retailers face, and look, let's be brutally honest, it's a very difficult operating environment out there for business in general, and I think for discretionary consumer categories in particular. And I think if you're a brand or a retailer that's selling clothing, you're dealing with inventory issues, you're dealing with you know higher promotions than you want to offer to customers, you're dealing with, as a result, margin pressures, you're dealing with increasing pressure from regulations and consumer awareness around sustainability and circularity and doing the right thing by the environment. So people are busy. <laughs> you know, people got a lot going on in order to make sure that their core businesses are delivering according to their expectations. So when ThreadUp shows up and says, hey, we want to talk to you about resale, I think a challenge is, hey, can they, do they, are they forward-looking enough to start to invest in that now? Because it's the classic analogy where you know, if you were to advance in your mind 6, 12, 18 months from now and you say to yourself, hey, do I want to have addressed the resale opportunity in some way? Do I want to make sure that we have a clear resale strategy? I think every executive is going to say, well, of course I do. Of course I want all those pieces to be in place. And so we try to make it really easy for those brands to nail what their resale strategy is going to be to help them overcome those perceived challenges and, and help them get into the business and start to generate profits and frankly also generate a reputation for doing the right thing about the environment, which their customers are increasingly caring about. Agree 100% to Anthony that there are a lot of things <laughs> happening, a lot of different dynamics in play. So I'm sure there's a discussion around how to prioritize, how to shuffle all the cards in the deck, so to speak. But let's dig into the profitability point, because I think it is something that is coming up a lot more. I know, you know, we just did a pretty deep dive report on this very topic. So let's talk about the barriers, I guess, to profitability for resale. Like what are some of the I don't want to say red flags, but what are the indicators or reasons why resale experience or operation could isn't as profitable as it could be or should be? Our experience here when we're working with brands is, and if we were to kind of assess their success in resale from a profitability perspective, it usually goes sideways when the brand isn't clear about their goals. So if the brand's goal is to roll out a resale site to have a circularity program, but only really to kind of dip their toe into the water, then they really shouldn't expect to see millions of units of item sales. You know, if they're only going to have a resale shop with 100 items in it or 50 items in it, then they're going to get what they bargained for. They're going to have a very small instance of resale that customers aren't going to engage with. So I think it's really important that they say, hey, we want this to be profitable, then they should work to build a consumer experience, a shopping experience that has the right level of assortment, the right kind of items, the right pricing, the right merchandising, the right integration with their brand, and a thoughtful strategy around what they expect to happen when customers show up on their site and see both new and used product. And like I can tell you what happens. They buy more stuff because those customers are already out there buying used. And so when they see it merchandised by the brand itself, by the brand owner, it can be a very powerful validation of the quality of the product. And it puts it in a context where the customer already wants to engage with that brand. So I think if brands are clear about their goals and they're really honest with themselves about what they're trying to achieve, that will be the biggest thing they can do to lower any barriers to profits. Got it. And I do want to go like one layer deeper. I feel like this could ultimately be a three hour conversation because there are so many nuances and considerations here. But because like you said, profitability is such a top of mind issue right now across the business, right? Like not just talking about resale, but it's like executive leadership teams are more closely 
assessing technology investments or thinking about their product roadmaps or their growth roadmaps, what channels they're selling through. So how does resale kind of come into the conversation at the executive leadership level? Like who is involved? Like who is largely driving these conversations? And, you know, how are they thinking about it, I guess, in terms of like their broader business strategy? Yeah, I think it's a great question because there's really different ways it can play out inside of an apparel brand. And I I think there's maybe there's a couple different scenarios. One is, is that the leadership just says, hey, we need to do this. And we are going to set it up in a way where the KPIs make sense, where we're going to give it the right level of investment and promotion to our customers. And and we're going to go ahead and go. Another approach is, is it sort of comes into the organization through a chief sustainability officer or someone who's really focused on getting the company ship shape as much as possible on their policies and practices around being more sustainable. And probably a third version is it comes in through the marketing team who's like, hey, we're seeing all this customer research that says that our customers are buying a ton of our product used. And probably the most successful version of that is the first, where it's really the leadership who says, hey, I know the merchandising department may not be super excited about selling used product next to new because merchants are in the business to sell new clothing. This is what our customers are doing. So we've got to figure out a strategy so that the strategy isn't just, hey, we're going to kind of put our heads in the sand. Another scenario that actually can work quite well and sort of get aside from that is where brands simply engage with us or in resale from a circularity perspective, meaning they offer a take back program where customers can come to their site order a clean out kit, which is like a hamper sized bag that they send to customers and that we will send to customers on their behalf. And they could put used clothing in that bag that they're no longer wearing and then get credit to shop on that site. Those are highly successful, super high ROI programs that don't get in the way the new product that most brands are primarily in the business of selling. So that can be a place to start And then they start to see, wow, a lot of our customers already know about this. They're already engaging in this behavior around circularity. Now can we extend our program here from a take-back program to something where we're actually merchandising and featuring used product on our digital property or even on our our physical property in some cases that some brands, many brands are thinking about. So those are a couple of the ways in, but super clear goals, super clear executive sponsorship go a long way. That's great. So tacking onto that point about goals, I know when we last spoke at Shop Talk, you mentioned that one of the big questions that brands should be asking and answering is how does resale coexist with the brand, right? Like how do the two things play together, work together, support each other? I would love for you to expand upon that further. And moreover, spotlight why this question is so important, especially as we think about the customer experience, the association of resale in context of the brand, because I feel like that this is such an interesting and critical angle that I I feel like isn't really discussed in as much detail as it should be. It's all about aligning your resale strategy with your brand DNA. So great brands spend a lot of time thinking about what customer, at what price, at what value proposition. They think a lot about their design, their photography. They think a lot about pricing and merchandising and their seasonal strategy. And I think all of those same pieces are relevant when it comes to developing a resale shop. What is it about the product you put in your resale shop, the pricing of that product, positioning of it, how you talk about it, where it shows up, how it shows up? How does that all read for your brand in a way that's authentic to you? And I think every brand has the opportunity to roll a resale site in the same way, the same level of attention that they give to their core product. And when you see, when the customer sees that consistency, I actually think the willingness to pay for the used product increases. You know, when the brand brings its full imprimatur to use product, the used product has a halo and that really benefits the brand overall. It's not seen as something that's diminishing the brand. It's actually seen as something that's reinforcing the brand It's showing customers that, hey, our product is good enough and high quality enough to sell again, to sell used. And it just brings more of those shoppers into the brand who maybe were curious about it, who 
weren't ready to buy it new, but you sort of get them hooked on your style and your brand with used product. And then the relationship with the customer expands from there. No, that's great. A lot of interesting interplays between is resale the starting point for a customer? Or is it the next step in the relationship? between consumers and brands, right? Because I know some people are are so connected to a brand that they keep buying over and over again. So obviously resale creates that opportunity for them to put products back into the world so they can buy more ultimately. But I feel like if our listeners take anything, you know, I think there are a lot of great nuggets here, but if they were to distill and, and focus in on one, I think that point around How does the brand mission and promise really come to life and how is it supported through resale is just a really, a really important takeaway and exercise that I think our listeners can go through. But considering the incredible growth and the moments of innovation and exploration that have happened within resale, Anthony, how will ThreadUp continue to support the growth and evolution of the resale market? I mean, obviously, it seems like we can't go a day without seeing another fantastic brand partnership. But what else are you all focusing on right now? We're really focused on First and foremost, our primary mission, which is to inspire a new generation of shoppers to think secondhand first. And there's a couple pieces to us delivering on that mission. The first is, is whether we are showing the product on ThreadUp site or on our partner sites to make sure it's as easy to shop as new, that it's seasonally relevant, that it's exciting product, that it's fresh every day. Because remember, even though it's used product, it's new to someone. And so every day we want there to be the right mix of items that have the right relevance to the person that are priced right. And that also really just make that person think twice before buying something new. We want them to think to themselves, well, let me just check and see if I can buy use. The quality is amazing. The shopping experience is fantastic. The assortment is there. The value is there. And I could do it feeling a little less guilty than I might otherwise by just consuming more and without sort of being a part of the solution to some of the broader issues around the environment. On the side for sellers, this product, this amazing secondhand product comes from closets of people across America. And so we wanna continue to make it super easy for people to send us the clothing that they're no longer wearing. And everyone, every woman in America, every person in America has about 50, 60% of the items in their closet that they don't even wear. And so we want them to take the highest quality items out of their closet and send them to us so that we can photograph them and price them and put them back into the hands of somebody who can use them. And in return, you get a bit of money and a great feeling of doing the right thing and a bit of karma too. So that's really the focus for us. It's great shopping experiences for our buyers, great selling experiences for our sellers, and also helping our resale partners who want to get into this business understand how they can put together a strategy that works for them, that's capital efficient, that generates profits, and that positions them in the right way for their customer and their customers' expectations for their brand. Awesome. Well, Anthony, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for taking the time to dig into some of the topics we've previously discussed and covering some some insights, some some takeaways for our listeners that feel that feel actionable and meaningful because obviously there's a lot of growth potential here and this space is growing and evolving. So I appreciate that we could distill some points that could help our listeners capitalize on the opportunity as well. So appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alicia. And to all of you listening, if you have any follow-up questions for Anthony or the ThreadUp team, we will be sure to tag them in our social posts for this episode so you can continue the conversation. As a gentle reminder, our Twitter is at our touch points and LinkedIn, of course, is retail touch points. There are so many layers to this conversation, so we would love to keep the conversation going. And of course, let us know how you like this episode. Leave us a rating or review on your preferred podcast player. We are on Spotify. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else, we are likely there. And while you tell us how you like this episode, be sure to subscribe. We have new episodes coming to you weekly where we sit down with executives and brands who are changing the entire shopping experience. But for now, that is it from us, everyone. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.